Howdy, and welcome to Wise About Texas, the Texas History Podcast. I'm your host, Ken Wise. I want to thank you for tuning in today for a little bit of Texas history. I want to especially recognize my international audience today. This podcast is being heard in 106 countries around the world. I never would have imagined. But I'm glad you all are interested in Texas history. I appreciate you. I hope uh, some of our international listeners will Send your questions and episode ideas to host at wiseabouttexas.com. I'd love to hear from you. Well, today we're going to talk about a lovely little town called Progress City. Now, who wouldn't want to live in a place called Progress City? One can only imagine the promise and prosperity of such a place. No doubt it would spring up uh, alongside that great symbol of American progress, the railroad. It would no doubt lie in the most prosperous of fertile farming ground, perhaps well watered by clean spring water and dried gently by a beautiful sun. Well, people would obviously line up to buy lots in such a town. There was just one problem. It didn't exist. And when you think about travel in Texas, you have got to start with trains. Trains change this state. They tra- they changed America, of course, but they really allowed Texas to expand. Prior to trains, we had wagons uh, taking goods from as far west and or as far in, into the interior as they could to the nearest navigable river that ran to the coast or to the actual coast itself. And that's why, you know, Texas was so blessed when the early settlers discovered all the navigable north to south rivers they could use. But with trains, it still went to the coast, but much faster and in greater and more reliable quantities, people could ship all kinds of goods to the ports of the state and on to the world. As Texas moved west, so did its railroads. Railroads were chartered by the state, and there were several entrepreneurial types interested in building the roads that would transport Texas. One of the railroads that came to Texas from Kansas City was called the Kansas City, Mexico, and Orient Railway. This railroad, the the vision of the founder was to connect Kansas City, Missouri, a hub of Midwestern agricultural markets, to uh, through Texas, to what the founder of this railroad claimed was the closest Pacific port to Kansas City, in Topo Lobampo, Mexico. I'm going to spell that: T O P O L O B A M P O. Somebody email me and tell me how to pronounce that. I'm going to say Topo Labampo because it's fun to say. That's a, a town, a port town in the state of Sinaloa, and from there uh, the goods in theory could be shipped to Asia, hence the Orient in the name. Now I did a little Google map search, and Los Angeles is actually 74 miles closer, according to the Google, than uh, Topo Labampo, closer to Kansas City, but whatever. Back then, perhaps uh, it was easier to get to Mexico. Well, this railroad needed a Texas subsidiary to operate in the state, and that was called the Colorado Valley Railway Company. So here's how the railroad started building. It built a line from Sweetwater, Texas, to the Red River, so going north, and that was going to connect with an existing Kansas City, Mexico, and Orient line. Another railroad uh, soon bought the charter, the Texas charter, And then the founder of the Kansas City, Mexico, and Orient Railroad bought the company that acquired the charter, the Texas charter, from him. So we need to talk about this guy. Uh, The founder was a guy named Arthur Stilwell. Stilwell was from New York. He moved to Kansas City in 1886, and he had built some small railroads. Then he built a railroad from Kansas City to the Gulf of Mexico, and it terminated at Sabine Pass in Texas. Uh, He actually got some money together, and he was a founder of the town of Port Arthur, Texas, and the town of Sabine Lake. Uh, He finished that railroad, but that railroad soon went bankrupt, which was a theme in Arthur Stilwell's business career. That railroad railroad was taken over, so he went on to found the Kansas City, Mexico, and Orient. Well, uh, the KC M&O made it to the Red River in 1909, 
It uh, continued to build south and west to San Angelo, also in 1909, so he was working on it. By 1912, he had 630 miles of it built, and then there were some segments in Mexico that he that he had built but it had not been connected. Um, he met, his railroad met the very historic Galveston, Harrisburg, and San Antonio Railway in Alpine in far west Texas and Big Ben in 1913. Uh, those Galveston, Harrisburg, San Antonio tracks are still there, by the way. And um, so now we had railroad in Big Bend. Well, that is an opportunity, isn't it, for progress. So enter the development of the metropolis of Progress City. The survey for Prog- Progress City was called Survey 19 in Brewster County. And Survey 19 was sold to Lee Davis in Waco. Now, it was actually sold to Lee and his mother, Catherine. Catherine was a descendant of the McLennans, the uh, founders of the area, and for whom McLennan County, where Waco sits, is named. Um, Davis's father was a Texas Revolution veteran, also named Lee Davis. Well, upon uh, completing the transaction, Davis's mother sold him her interest, so Lee Davis owned Survey 19 in Brewster County. Apparently, um, Davis never bothered to pay the taxes, uh, but he did develop the property, sort of. You see, the land was located about two miles northeast of Santiago Peak. Now, if you read uh, History of Progress City, you'll see a lot of stories about the town actually being located on the top of Santiago Peak, which makes for a much better story when you hear the end. But the truth is, uh, as Paul Wright researched uh, several years ago, the survey actually uh, lie, lay two miles to the northeast. Um, and if you look at the survey and look at a map, you see that. It's pretty obvious. Uh, but much of the Survey 19 did begin to climb up uh, the peaks in the in that area, and it ended up uh, rising to a point of 4,747 feet up the mountains. Uh, needless to say, building a town up the side of a mountain in Big Bend would present a challenge. Well, the Progress City Town Site Company was created with Davis as calling himself the owner and secretary, and a man named James Mauk, M-A-U-K, listed as presidents, and they began selling lots. Now, what they were selling was a lot that measured 25 by 120 feet. 25 feet is not really wide enough to build on, so, of course, uh, the purchaser would need to buy two lots. And that was no problem uh, because they were so cheap. The documents that were recorded in Brewster County showed a price of 150 but, of course, when you're dealing with real estate documents, oftentimes you'll say, Uh, just some low amount, uh, but the real price that was paid was a lot higher. We think that the lots might have been selling uh, for 10 or more dollars, um, but the reflected price was $1.50. And then what they would do is go to another friend of theirs, a clerk in McLennan County named R.V. McLean, who would notarize the deeds to these lots. Well, the plat for the town of Progress City that they would show folks to sell them a lot, showed the Kansas City, Mexico, and Orient Railroad running right down uh, what I believe was 23rd Street, if I recall, in Progress City, right down the middle of a main street in town, which is exactly what you'd want to see in a future boom town. There was only one problem. By the time Davis had platted this town out, Stillwell had already bought land and reserved right away for a rail extension for his Kansas City, Mexico, and Orient Railroad to Presidio. So Davis would have known exactly where that railroad would be, and it was not running down the street of any town uh, named Progress City. In fact, it was about 45 miles away. Well, Davis ended up selling 2,766 lots, according to the records, and that made him about 6000 bucks or more, perhaps, if the true prices were higher, which is not a bad living in the early 1900s. Uh, in fact, 99 lots of that 2766 were sold more than once, which should surprise no one at this point. Well, who were buying these lots? Well, 
Davis was from McLennan County, so you'd think they'd have sold a lot around town, wouldn't you? Well, only two people in Waco bought lots there where Davis lived. You think they knew something about him? The folks in Dallas and Tarrant County, however, didn't because each of those counties had over 100 buyers. Interestingly, he also sold over 100 lots in Jones County, which is not too far away from Sweetwater. It's just north of Abilene. And if you look at a map of where Davis's lot sales were, if you kind of plot the counties out, uh, Davis sold and moved, sold and moved, and sold and moved. He, he even eventually sold some lots to some folks in Louisiana. Well, there's no doubt that nobody visited the land before buying these lots, but someone eventually must have, because on February 10th, 1919, a Brewster County grand jury charged Davis for land fraud. But you know what? That did not stop this land from being on the tax rolls. At the same time the grand jury was charging Davis with land fraud, the tax assessor in Brewster County was trying to collect taxes on this town that didn't exist. In fact, for a few years after these lot sales, those lots were still on the tax rolls. Uh, Davis actually embraced the grand jury charges, claiming that uh, it was merely a county seat fight. And throughout Texas history, especially the further west you go, you have some just epic fights between cities, uh, some involving force of arms over where the county seat is going to be, because obviously that's going to be a more prosperous town. There's even one, and don't worry, the future topic list for Wise About Texas has several of these stories on it. And one of them involves actually moving the courthouse itself, not merely the records. Um, He also embraced uh, or used the fact that these lots were on the tax rolls as proof that this was valuable land. But as these schemes uh, tend to evolve, uh, this one did the same. It was not going to last. Sales of these lots had already started to slow, uh, no doubt from Davis not staying around one place too long. His uh, buddy in the clerk's office in McLennan County was not notarizing deeds anymore. There were lots longer delays between the dates of the transaction and the filing in the Brewster County Courthouse uh, due perhaps to the uh, fact that Davis was not only moving around but moving further away, uh, so it took the mail longer, and folks were not paying the taxes on the land. Finally, In 1916, the Brewster County Commissioner's Court issued an order declaring that Progress City was null and void. But what about the railroad, that Kansas City, Mexico, and Orient? Well, in Stillwell fashion, it went bankrupt. Arthur Stillwell blamed that bankruptcy on what he termed, quote, the cannibals of Wall Street, Close quote. He also had a uh, weird, unnatural antagonism toward John W. Gates, the guy that invented barbed wire. He blamed Gates by name uh, for the demise of the KCMO. Um, he claimed also, by the way, this is interesting about Stillwell, not sure what this means, but he claimed uh, to someone that his ideas for railroads came from quote unquote brownies. Now, I'm not sure what he meant by that. Uh, But if he meant the brownies I'm thinking of, I'm not sure, but that something wasn't in those brownies because Arthur had a lot of schemes that he came up with. And when he moved on from the railroad business, he turned into some sort of poet and writer intending to write books and poems and novels, but never became the railroad magnate he fancied himself. Well, how about old Lee Davis, the founder and promoter of Progress City? Well, he was last seen in 1919 hawking drilling opportunities in East Texas. But that is another story. Well, we now come to the part of the episode I call Getting There. Um, Obviously, we're going to talk about Big Bend. Big Bend is always fun to visit. Uh, This episode is being released in late February 2019, a perfect time of year to start thinking about headed west. Um, If you go to Marathon, Texas, and yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's pronounced Marathon, not Marathon, Go to Marathon, Texas, cross the railroad tracks, and head south down Highway 385 toward the Persimmon Gap Visitor Center at Big Bend. 
about 28 miles down the road, look to your right as you're traveling south, and you'll see Santiago Peak. It's 6,524 feet high, so you'll know it when you see it. Trust me. When you're done checking out the peak, head back to Marathon and stop in the White Elephant Bar at the Gage Hotel. One of my favorite spots to relax in Big Ben. Oh, by the way, when you're driving down 385, you'll roughly be driving down the Great Comanche War Trail that we talked about in a previous episode. But get out to Big Ben as soon as you can. It's really a special place. But don't waste any time looking for Progress City. Well, that wraps it up for another episode of Wise About Texas. Thank you very much for tuning in today. Be sure and follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Wise About Texas. Like the like and share the Wise About Texas Facebook page. And I mentioned that this episode is being released in late February. We're in the high holy days of Texas history. And don't worry, the next episode we'll be talking about the revolution. Thanks again for listening. Go out and do something for Texas today. Until next time, God bless Texas, and we'll see you down the road.